Hollow Knight, Lethal Company, Celeste, some of the most prominent games in the world are indie titles. But before the late 2000s, almost nobody played them. There were a couple breakout indies here and there, but most went completely unnoticed. The problem wasn't that indies were bad. The problem was the developers had no way to make them or get them in the hands of players. That is, until the stars aligned and the game that kickstarted the indie revolution released. When gaming began, all development was indie. There was no such thing as AAA because the industry was tiny. Every market starts with small early innovators and many of the studios that are considered AAA today started in the 70s and early 80s, making games for home consoles like the Atari. But these game dev studios were few and far between. It was difficult to start a game studio because of all these upfront costs, costs like development, distribution, and console publishing fees. So hobbyist game developers just didn't really exist at the time, unless you could create everything from scratch and find the money to cover all these costs. But even if you could make a game and had the money to do it, the only companies that were able to get games into the hands of players were the companies that had their own consoles like Atari. Because of this, developing and releasing your own indie game was basically impossible. But indie development came alive in the 80s when the video game crash of 1983 happened. The video game industry had seen such rapid growth causing many low quality games to be released. This made the market saturated and almost overnight video game sales tanked dropping a total of 97%. Lots of companies failed, and the survivors were nervous that video games might have just become a fad. Luckily though, at the same time, new PCs released, giving gamers a lifeline. Some of these PCs like the Commodore 64 had toolkits on them to create your own games, and many gamers used these to fill the gaps left behind by the crash. The biggest market, however, was still consoles, and partnering with these guys to distribute your game after the crash was even harder than before. Companies like Nintendo were terrified of any unnecessary risk. So just like the 70s, unless you had money to publish a game yourself, there wasn't really an easy way to get your game into players' hands. So few indie games had real success in the 80s. And if they did, they had to take really unconventional and inconvenient routes to sell any copies. One of the most successful indie PC games at the time, Football Manager, was advertised through video game magazines. If you wanted a copy, you would send them a check in the mail and then you'd get the game sent back to you. This got rid of all these upfront manufacturing costs, but advertising was expensive and risky, something most developers couldn't really afford. Then there was shareware. This was when a section of the game was downloadable for free. And if you liked it and wanted to play the rest, you would mail some money to the company and they would then send you the disc to download the full game. Kind of like a demo today. The most successful shareware game was Doom by id Software, but just like Football Manager, they had to use all sorts of unique strategies to bring awareness to Doom. However, id only was able to do this because they had released some moderately successful games before Doom, using money from those games to fund their shareware model. So shareware had shown that it was a viable distribution method, but it still wasn't feasible for most devs and it died out in the late 90s as digital games became normalized, with websites like Newgrounds becoming one of the best options for indie developers. On top of that, easy to use tools such as GameMaker, RPG Maker, and others were releasing around this time as well. Creating games was getting easier, but the same issues were still there. Getting indie games on popular platforms was next to impossible, but one man was going to help change that, Jonathan Blow. Now, Jonathan had been a long time game developer. Uh, I then, in around uh, February of 1996, started a game company here in San Francisco with a friend of mine from college. But within a couple of years, it went bankrupt. But so we, we made that and we were really poor for years. We ended up like $120,000 in debt back when that was really real money. After that, he worked as a contractor for some large game studios for a few years, but he wanted to work on something he was passionate about. So he started creating his own game. That I need to be working on the things that I care about the most, right? And as long as I'm doing that, then I have no problem putting in infinite amounts of work. The core mechanic was rewinding time. Are you about to die? People are like, oh, shit, I'm gonna die. <laughs> Jonathan was intrigued by a conversation he had with some other game designers about time implementation in games like Prince of Persia. And he wasn't a huge fan of how it had been done, thinking he could do better. Some of my friends were arguing about rewind in video games. Um, a recent game that had come out at that time was Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Some of the other people were arguing, well, uh, if you do that, you're gonna take away all consequence from games, and isn't that 
a bad thing. But what bugged me was like nobody actually was interested enough to try it, right? People just talked about it. And I guess that's a common theme everywhere, right? It's hard to try things, it takes work. He was also inspired by platforms like Mario and Donkey Kong and wanted to create a platformer of his own with a complex and interwoven narrative and unique mechanics. So with some solid ideas, Jonathan got to work. He worked on the game part-time over the next year and nearly finished it by late 2005. So Jonathan started taking his game to festivals like GDC and Independent Games Fest, where it won awards for its innovative design and he got lots of positive attention. Jonathan then hired an artist to make the game look professional, taking Braid to new heights. But unfortunately, there was a problem. Jonathan knew his game was good and wanted to get it to as many people as he possibly could. Making a great game was hard, but it was even harder to get it published. Nowadays, the go-to option for indie devs are digital game marketplaces like Steam, Epic, and Game Pass. But at the time, Epic's marketplace and Game Pass didn't exist, and Steam only really partnered with a select few third-party developers. But Jonathan wanted to be on that list. So he met with Valve. Valve was very skeptical about even the idea that Steam could sell independent games, and they rejected it. The, the number that was given to me at the time was, you know, less than 5,000 people are ever going to buy this game on Steam. Even though Valve had started expanding, they didn't think indie games had any potential to be successful. But after getting rejected by Valve, Braid caught the attention of someone else, an unlikely partner at the time. Microsoft had created its own digital marketplace for the Xbox and wanted to increase its library of exclusive games. They created an event called the Summer of Arcade to expand their exclusive catalog and highlight some indie games, and they wanted Braid to be featured. Now, Jonathan felt like Braid was better suited for PC, but without Steam, it wasn't really an option anymore, at least if he wanted to get mass market reach. So he took Microsoft up on their offer. With no idea what to expect, Braid released on the XBLA on August 6, 2008. And to everyone's surprise, Braid took over. Within its first week, it sold 55,000 copies, immediately blowing Valve's predictions out of the water. Braid then went on to sell over half a million copies. That same summer, Castle Crashers also released on XBLA, another indie game that saw massive success and has gone on to sell over 20 million copies. Big companies finally realized that indies could succeed and even had the potential to sell better than many AAA titles. For a long time, game development companies were so focused on graphics, trends, and incredible cinematics. But Braid and these other successful indies showed what gamers really care about, enjoyable and unique experiences. With this new knowledge, the indie revolution began. With proof that indies could be commercial successes, publishers and digital marketplaces started partnering with indies. Xbox continued to do the Summer of Arcade series and highlighted other great indies like Limbo, Super Meat Boy, and Bastion. But we celebrate Braid specifically because its success was the perfect storm. For a long time, indie games sat by the wayside, with passionate developers never getting the opportunity to make and sell what they love. But because Microsoft was willing to take a chance on indies and help prove that gamers cared more about unique experiences than cutting edge technology, other publishers saw the potential of indies. If Jonathan had made Braid five years earlier, he might have never been able to get it distributed and just given up on it. Right when he was ready to release it, Microsoft was there. Most importantly, Braid also was a great game. It showed people that indie games could be fun, thought provoking, and meaningful. People learned that indies were the best place to get unique experiences. After Braid, Steam began to expand its catalog of indie titles, leading to the creation of Steam Greenlight in 2012, which allowed the users to vote on what indie games should be added to Steam next. Microsoft helped push indies into the spotlight, but they dropped the ball and let Steam become one of the biggest digital game marketplaces in the world. And in 2017, Steam removed Greenlight in favor of Steam Direct, which allows anyone to publish their game after paying a fee. Before Braid, barely any indie game got on popular platforms. But last year alone, over 14,000 games were added to Steam, most being indies. So Braid came out at just the right time, and it deserves a special place in history for its part in kickstarting the indie revolution. 20 years ago, most gamers didn't know indies existed, but today, most gamers view indies with just as much respect or more than triple A's. The best part is creating a successful indie game isn't a pipe dream anymore. Everyone has the ability to create and publish a great game. While being an indie developer is easier than ever, it's still incredibly challenging. In today's world, it may be easy to get your game published, but actually getting your game noticed, that's the hard part. With so many free platforms and social media, it can be hard to stand out and create something unique. But if you wanna find out how to be successful as an indie developer, 
go check out our video, Why 96% of Indie Games Fail. And if you haven't played Braid yet, the Anniversary Edition released this April. It's the Indie Game shout out for this video. So if you're interested, go check it out.